since darkest night I was wandering alone A stranger to mercy I stood But the Savior came nigh When he heard my feet cry And he put my sins under the blood They are covered by the blood They are covered by the blood My sins are all covered by the blood
page 448, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Good to see you this morning. We're going to open the service with a word of prayer. I thought out of the corner of my eye, I saw Brother Don Burchett come in. He's not sitting where they used to sit. Come, Brother Don, would you come up here? I want you to open the service in prayer this morning. I'm so glad to see you guys. So one of two things has happened. Either you got right with God and came back, or you're just here to visit. Just visiting. All right. Well, we tried. Thank you for being here this morning. We sure appreciate you. We miss you and Miss Molly very much. And I want you to ask the Lord's blessing on the service this morning. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to come here and gather this morning. Heavenly Father, just pray that you be the pastor and give him the words for each and every one of us. And may it enrich our Christian lives. And Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for love and what you did on the cross for us. And may everything said here today be bring honor and glory to you and your kingdom. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated.
Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing page number 833. 833, and I trust like the choir, your name is there, and your name is under the blood. 833, under the blood. The burden of sin has been lifted As far as the east is from west They're buried without remembrance In God's sea of forgetfulness I've been to Calvary's mountain My name is written upon When Satan makes accusations I tell them they're under the blood They're under the be seated this morning. I've asked Brother Greg to join me up here on the platform because I have, he's got an announcement that he's going to make, and then we have some other announcements when he's all finished. Brother Greg, you come on. So Shelly and I have been praying quite a bit about something over the past couple of weeks, talked to some of the men here and pastor, and 
you know, one of the things I mentioned to my wife is that she really needs to in, embrace her mistakes. So she came up and gave me a hug. That's, that's for my uh, senior class. But seriously, uh, we've been praying about something for a long time. As you know, my wife hasn't been coming to church here. And we really feel strongly that we should be going to church together, serving together. We haven't been able to do that for quite some time. And so this will be my last day at the church here. And, um, you know, it's kind of a hard decision, but I just really wanted to make sure that there was no misunderstanding here. This is something that Shelly and I have been praying about, Pastor and I have prayed about. There's several men here that have been praying with me about this thing, and it's not an easy decision, but we really feel like this is the right decision for right now. So right now, that's, uh, we're going to be at least give it several weeks or so. Um, you will, whether you want to or not, you'll probably see me at different occasions, whether at a parade or men's prayer breakfast or something like that. I'll definitely be visiting, but uh, I just want to let you know that um, I love you. The church has been great. I appreciate the pastor and, and especially the Lord for giving me the opportunity to serve here in so many different capacities and learn a lot. And the preaching has been great. The teaching has been great. There's Nothing that anybody has said or done, except for maybe the color of the pews. No, but anyways, um, nothing anybody has ever said or done or any decisions or anything like this. This is purely a decision between my wife and I and the Lord, and we just feel like this is the right decision for us. So I want to thank you all. Um, you've been encouragement to me. Um, and again, I just I love you all. I love Pastor. And uh, everybody here, it's been, it's been a, a great time of service. So thank you. Thanks, Pastor. All right, ushers, come on with those offering plates. Man, I hate these kinds of announcements. It breaks my heart, and um, I, am, uh, I am excited that Brother Greg is going to be, I, I, don't doubt, I don't doubt a bit that the Lord's going to do something with Brother Greg and Miss Shelley. Um, I know Brother Greg well enough that he's not just going to sit by and uh, do nothing. He has a gift for teaching. He, I'm telling you, he has a gift for it, and I, I've told him this to his face. I believe the Lord's got big plans for him. And, um, Brother Greg, what year did you guys start coming? Um, I don't quite forget, but I can remember easily because Melody was pregnant with Isaac. So that's kind of what it was all about. <laughs> what's, what's that, Melody? 2009. We've been here since 2009. And Brother Greg has been so faithful, yeah. so faithful. I'll say two things about Brother Greg. Um, number one is I, I don't know a single time where he has caused any trouble. I, I don't know it. I, I, in all those years, not one time have, has he caused me any grief, has he caused any trouble in, in the church. And then I'll say this about Brother Greg, and I, I hope that every one of us can have it said about us as well. If we have to leave a church someday, we ought to leave a hole. We ought to be so involved and interwoven with the work of the ministry that something will be noticed undone when we leave. And that's Brother Greg. He has been so faithful. And um, uh, he, he, we were talking about it again this morning, and we were talking about him making that announcement. And uh, one of his concerns, one of my concerns, is that um, people leave this place this morning thinking anything other than we are on good terms and there is no, there's no issues. It's, it's, uh, if you have to leave a church, this is a good way to leave it. And um, he'll be back. He's not leaving the area. And uh, I believe he'll be here for different events and different services and those kinds of things. And he is very welcome. Him and Michelle, they both are welcome here anytime. Yeah. We count them a friend of Faith Baptist Church. Amen? Yeah. All right. A couple of announcements just real quick. Um, this, uh, this evening will be our TFM Sunday evening service. We'll be having a graduation. Miss Shandy Stark is graduating from Thoroughly Furnished Ministries. And the young people will uh, have the, the whole service. They'll be taking care of some of the music for us. Um, Brother Matthew Kennedy will be preaching uh, for us, and I'm looking forward to that. None of you have ever heard him preach, including me. And so, um, but I, I've, uh, I've looked at his sermons and, and uh, seen some things he's done in TFM, and I am looking forward to seeing what the Lord will do tonight in the service. So please be here for that. Don't sit at home. Come encourage these kids. Uh, Thoroughly Furnished Ministries is not an easy program, an easy course. It requires a lot of commitment, and it is not for everybody. It's not for everybody. If you can't be for everything, then it may not be for these kids, but the ones that are in it, they're in it for the long haul, and I'm, I want you to come encourage them this evening, and you'll hear some, I believe there's some testimonies from the kids, and then, of course, Brother Matt will be preaching, and we want you to come be a part of that. All right, having said all of that, uh, there will be no 
Choir practice this evening at 4.30. Brother Dowdy has to be out of town. He won't be here tonight uh, for, for that. And so it kind of worked out well, I guess, with it being TFM Sunday. Uh, but there'll be no choir practice. Service will be at 6 p.m. And everybody will be right up here. Brother Dowdy, I've got teenagers about ready to string me up because they were counting. I think it's been nine weeks since you guys have had a class on Sunday nights. Uh, every time we have a missionary or a special event of some sort, we always keep everybody upstairs. And our Brother Dowdy is always so gracious about that. But I will say this this evening, even if we weren't having TFM Sunday, it's Brother Dowdy's fault. He won't be here. So uh, teenagers, string him up alongside of me. All right. That's all I'm saying. There was one more announcement that I'm forgetting about. Oh, um, on Saturday. Uh, so a few weeks ago, uh, someone, uh, an individual in our church uh, gave us $4,000 to try to get a better set of speakers in this building. These speakers are very old. We've had them for, we had them in, in the old building, uh, and they're, they're just very old, and I uh, get complaints often about people either not being able to hear or it being too loud and all of that. And uh, someone gave us $4,000 to get this, uh, new, new speakers, new cabling, and it's about half of what we need, uh, but we went ahead and moved forward with it anyway. Anyway, um, but they are going to be installed this coming Saturday. And so all of the choir, we made the announcement in choir practice, but there's a lot of you that were not here for it. At 2 p.m. this coming Saturday, choir, if you could be here just for about a 30 or 45 minute choir practice, um, the technician is going to be tuning everything and getting the microphones all set for all of that. And so if you could help us with that choir, we'd sure appreciate it. It will not be an all afternoon thing, but if you could be here at two o'clock, we'll get you up here. We'll get you sinking into the microphones and get everything set so that on Sunday morning, it's not a, a complete disaster. It may be somewhat a disaster, but it won't be a complete disaster if we can do that much on Saturday evening. All right. The wireman, is that everything? I've left my announcement card elsewhere in it. All right, he says yes. That means it's his fault at this point. Brother Stark, you've got the microphone. Would you ask the Lord's blessing on the offering, please, sir? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to gather uh, in the house of the Lord. And uh, we pray that uh, in these summer months with uh, good weather, we'll be able to use opportunities such as the, uh, the upcoming parades and other events in Chelsea uh, and Grass Lake to get the gospel message out. And... Uh, the family school hour really got me thinking this morning. I know many of us have uh, 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 family members that we're praying for that, that don't yet know the Lord. And uh, it says in the book of James, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, so prayer is very powerful. And uh, keep, keep praying for those, those lost loved ones. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Looked 
at me said don't look so blue cause I'm going up to heaven now how about you and I'll see all my friends in hallelujah square what a wonderful time we'll all have up there we'll sing and praise Jesus his glory to share and we'll all live forever in hallelujah square we'll sing and praise Jesus his glory to share and we'll all live forever Thank you for all the music this morning. Would you stand with me, please, and take your Bibles, find the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. The Gospel of Luke 14. Brother Wireman reminded me a moment ago that um, you'll notice a change in the bulletin, and if it hasn't already been reflected on the church app and calendar, it will be uh, before the day is up. We are not doing a 4th of July picnic this year. Uh, so you'll have most of the day off as, as a church. We are still going to have our church float in the uh, Grass Lake Parade that morning. But after the parade is over, you, you just go home and relax with your family and spend some time together. We will not be having to get together at the church. It's the first time in, in many, many years that we've not had a cookout together afterwards. But we've had so much going on, and I uh, think a lot of people still have not fully recovered from the missions work week. And then we have a special service this evening and really just a lot going on by the end of summer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with us taking some time off just to relax and recuperate a little bit. Uh, but you're not allowed to do that until after the parade. All right. We need your help with the parade on the 4th of July morning. It's a Thursday and uh, the, uh, all the details will be in your bulletin. But we need your help. We want you to come ride the float. We want you to come walk with the float. We've got, there's been years past where we've had 90 plus people come out to be from our church with the church float. And that is, uh, and that's incredible. We get so much done and accomplished uh, in the crowds giving out the, the, the gospel and the, the gospel tracts. And um, people recognize the church float and they, they look forward to us coming. Rarely is anyone not receptive to just taking a, a gospel tract. And we just need help getting them out. They don't give themselves out. The people of God do that. And so come out and help us with that if you would. On the 4th of July, we'll say more about that in the coming in the coming weeks. Uh, Luke chapter 14. Uh, I can't talk much about it right now because my time is slipping away, but the banner over my head talks about our Bible conference. And I hope that you have marked your calendar and that you're planning to be here for that entire conference. I fully believe for, for several reasons, but I fully believe it'll be the best Bible conference we've ever had. I am so looking forward to it. And so um, the, the speakers' names are not on there, but I'll give you all of those at a later time when I've got more time uh, to talk, uh, talk about it. Luke chapter 14, or if you're looking at it, say amen. Yeah. All right, Luke 14. Let's begin reading together in verse... 16. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And his servant at supper time, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Lord, would you bless your word? God, I need your help this morning. God, thank you for the privilege, Lord, the high, high honor it is to hold your word in front of us and to read it. God, I ask that you would let it be more than just words on a page this morning. God, I ask in the name of Jesus to please move on every single heart. God, prepare us to receive what you have for us. And God, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. Lord, people don't need to see me or hear from me. God, we need you this morning. So Lord, I ask you for your help with that. It's in the name of my Savior I ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Luke 14 really the middle section of the Gospel of Luke, but beginning in chapter 14, uh, all the way to the end of uh, midway through chapter 18, if you have a red letter edition Bible, most of the words in those, that section of scripture will be in red. It's Jesus talking and he's teaching. We find here in, he, him in teaching and, and speaking in different situations and different settings. Um, he's at some points talking to uh, 
Pharisees, sometimes he's talking to uh, some of his followers, sometimes he's talking directly with his disciples, but Jesus is doing a lot of talking in the passage that we're reading this morning. This particular passage we began reading in verse 16, it's Jesus telling a parable. It's a parable that he uses to illustrate a point. And if you don't know what a parable is, it's more than just a quaint saying. Uh, a parable is, a, is an earthly story with a divine or a heavenly meeting. Uh, it is a, it's a story that's intended to teach some, uh, some divine truth uh, to the hearers. And so Jesus, trying to illustrate a point, is telling the story about uh, a man. Now, the, the word Lord is not necessarily used here, but uh, it is it, the, the Lord of an estate, the master of the manor, if you will, has got big plans and he's cooked a supper and he's going to try to uh, host and and entertain a large crowd of uh, what's implied to be prominent people. And as we read this passage, I'm telling you, church, there's conviction to be found, uh, whether you are this morning saved or whether you're not, there's something in this passage for us. And the very fact that Jesus is using a parable, it, it, it widens the context a little bit. It makes room for us to have a little bit more liberty than we would at other times. And while the truth Jesus is trying to get across is a very specific truth, the fact that he's using a parable and that we're reading it 2,000 years later indicates that there's multiple ways to look at it. There's multiple morals of the story, if you will. So this morning, I'd like to give you uh, four or five things about this parable that we can make application into our own lives with. First of all, I want you to notice the supper. It says in verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. So let's just draw some inferences from that simple statement about this supper. This thing didn't happen accidentally or all by itself. Now, this great man, this, uh, this lord of the estate, if you will, uh, put some effort into this thing and made a supper, uh, created an event. A couple of things about this that we need to see, and as we go through this, I'll be making what I believe to be a very obvious comparison to salvation, and if you're here this morning and you do not know for sure, I'm talking about it is settled and nailed and fastened down in your heart and in your mind. If you don't know for sure that if you drew your final breath while sitting in this place, that you would open your eyes in the presence of God as his child to be with him for all of eternity... If you have any doubts about that this morning, I beg you, listen to the words I speak. Listen to what the Bible says. There's a truth found in this passage for you, and I'm begging you, would you listen this morning? And don't just listen as though you're sitting in an auditorium doing your religious duty for the day. Would you listen this morning asking God to convict your heart and to give you answers and to solidify something inside of you? Forget trying to apply the truths to those around you. Forget about the condition of the person sitting next to you. How about just examining your own heart for a little while? Some things about this supper is, number one, it was planned by the Lord. It was planned by the Lord, lowercase l, not the Lord Jesus, but in the parable, the Lord of the estate, the master, the great man of the property. It was planned by him. It is implied that it was not last minute because there were some people who had been invited. It was just implied that it wasn't just thrown together uh, carelessly. Uh, the implication is that this, this Lord prepared. He, he planned this ahead of time. And can I just say to you this morning, if you're in this place and you are saved, born again, that's wonderful. This ought to give you a better appreciation for it. But if you're here today and you're not saved, then what I'm about to tell you ought to make you yearn for and desire to have that which God has planned. 
You understand salvation did not happen by itself. People did not uh, just happen upon being saved from their sins. It was planned by God Almighty from the foundation of the world. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and maybe you want to find that and just follow along with me. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now listen to this. This is way back at the beginning of the history of man. Listen to what God tells Satan after he says, you're going to crawl on your belly, you serpent. Listen to what he says. He says, and I will, that means I'm planning something. I will means it's already in my mind. I will means I'm going to do something. Here's what he says. I will Put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall. There it is again. It is coming down the road. It is going to happen one day. I have made a plan. It says, it shall. It shall uh, bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know what God was saying way back in the beginning of all things? He says, I have a plan. I know what's going to happen, and I have planned for something for the people of the earth. You see, the parable began with a man made a great supper, made a feast. It was planned, and I'm telling you in the area of salvation, God made plans for us. Not only was it planned, but it was also prepared. It was also prepared. For those that are here today, And you know for sure that you're saved because you point to a time or a day or a moment in your life where you say, I got saved right there. For those of you that know that, you know exactly what I mean when I say it was a prepared supper. Prepared because I didn't have to do anything. He did it all. If we're going to stick with the analogy of the supper, all I had to do was show up. He did all the work. He covered all the cost. Hit. It was the Lord's Supper. It was his plan, and it was his preparation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know what that was? That was God's preparation for my salvation. He prepared for me. And then I've already alluded to it. It wasn't just a planned supper and a prepared supper. It was a paid for supper. Paid for. Admission was free. It didn't cost me a dime. It was a paid for supper. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Paid for. Paid in full. That's just the supper. Jesus starts by saying, hey, there's a a man that made a great supper. He planned and he prepared and he had paid for it. Number two, I'd like you to notice the timing. The timing. We find it says, all things are ready. At some point... At some point, uh, this man, having looked on all the preparation that had been made, looking after every detail, every price that had to be paid, looking on all of those things, he stood back and said, everything is ready. It's completed. The time is right now. There's a couple things about this timing is the time was known by the Lord, not by the guest. It's known by the Lord, not by the guest. I like what David said in Psalm 31. He said, my times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. We like to think that we're running this thing, don't we? Well, I've got a one-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and a 30-year plan. Just watch how I bring this plan to pass. We like to think we're in control. We like to sit down and calculate, run the numbers and say, yeah, I can or I can't do this or I will do this. I'm planning to fix this and I'll do that. Yeah, I don't know if you've noticed or not, life doesn't care what you plan. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, great plan. Do the best you can to prepare. But when it comes to salvation, God wasn't waiting on his guest to make things ready. 
God was the one who said, I'll tell you when it's time. The Lord of the estate knew the time. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, one of my favorite verses in the book of Galatians. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this, but when the fullness of time was come, you know what that means? That means when God said it's time. The time that God had set forth, that's what it says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. The Lord chose the time. We find the time was not just known by the Lord, it was chosen by the Lord according to Hebrews 9.27. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die. You don't get to pick that. God says that appointment is made, it's going to happen. The timing is very, very important. And then lastly, about the timing, I would just say the time was kept by the Lord. The schedule was kept by the Lord. I want you to notice what it says in Luke chapter 12. Just turn a few pages back. Look at Luke chapter 12. It says in verse 19, this is a, another parable about a, a rich man whose crops were doing very well every year. He was getting more and more, and it was so much that he couldn't contain all of his possessions. So he says, I'm going I'm to tear down my barns. I'm going to build new barns. And I'm just, only thing I'm going to focus on in this life is getting more, getting more, saving more, having more. That's all that matters to me day in, day out. I'm just going to get more. Listen to what the Bible says the response to that was in verse 19 of Luke 12. And I will say to my soul, this is, this is the rich man, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided in the matter of salvation, there are plenty of people who think I'm going to live my life until I'm good and ready to turn to the Lord. Once I've exhausted everything else, once I've lived all I want to live, once I've done all I want to do, I'll make time for God later. I'll make that schedule. This rich man found out that night he wasn't making the schedule. That appointment had already been made. He was called a fool for thinking that way. Number three, I'd like to, I'd like to point out the invitation. We've seen the supper. We've seen the timing. I'd like you to see the invitation. It says there in the passage, say to them which were bidden, come. Say to them which were bidden, come. This man gets the supper all finished, and he tells his servant, here's the guest list. I want you to go tell them all they need to come right now. Don't delay. Supper's ready. Tell them to come on. I want you to notice the details of this invitation. Number one, the invitation was delivered. It was delivered. I, I love the book of Hebrews chapter one. Uh, Hebrews might be the richest book in the New Testament. I, I don't know if you could ever make that judgment call, but it just seems like if you study the book of Hebrews, it's, it's really rich with, with what it has to say. But it opens up with what some would say is a totally uncharacteristic for a book of the Bible to open with the remarks that are made. There's no introduction about the penman. It doesn't say this is Paul. It doesn't say this is Peter. It doesn't say, hello, how are you doing? I wish you well. None of that appears. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, opens with these words. Listen to it. God, first word of the book, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. What an incredible word we just read. God, who at sundry times and divers manners, that is in a varied in many ways, spake unto man. It's incredible. How did God speak unto man? Well, it says he spake unto God by the prophets and in these last days hath spoken unto us by his own son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. How's that for opening remarks? It simply says, God spoke to man. That's what we just read. So I would tell you this morning, when it comes to salvation, the invitation has been delivered. You will never be able to say, I didn't know about it. 
You will never be able to stand before God and say, I was never given the opportunity. No one ever told me, I'm telling you this morning, the invitation has been given. You've got it in black and white in your lap. You've listened to preachers preach it. You've had opportunity. You felt the Holy Spirit move on your heart. The fault is no one's but your own if you don't respond to the invitation. The invitation has been delivered. That servant went out and invited all those people. I would say secondly about the invitation, the invitation was very simple. It's very simple. This servant went out, and the message he was told to deliver to all those that had been bidden to come, the message was very simple, one word, come. Come. Salvation is not complicated. You don't have to be an educated man. You don't have to be an educated woman. You don't have to have to have a bunch of degrees. You don't have to be an adult, fully matured in your mind to understand it. Salvation is simple. It consists of just one word, come. It's Jesus Christ saying, come unto me. It's God the Father saying, come to me through Jesus Christ. The message is come. The invitation, it it was delivered. And the invitation was very, very simple. It was come. There's no need to ask any more questions. There was no need any more detail. None of the guests could say, I don't really understand what you mean. Can uh, can, Can you explain it to me a little better? The servant said, the master sent me when I left. The dinner was done. The master says, come. It's all you have to do. Come. The guests weren't forced to come. They were invited to come. The servant delivered the message. A simple message, just come. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says this, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. It is not complicated. In fact, it's very, very simple. Any church or organization that complicates the gospel to the point that it includes any steps have perverted the simplicity of the gospel. It's such a simple message. Just come to him. Just come. Come. And then I would say, lastly, regarding the invitation, it was a final invitation. This wasn't the first call. This wasn't the second call. This was the only call. The servant went and found each person and walked up to him and said, supper's ready. The master says, come. We have nothing in the parable that says he went back by all those people on his way back just to remind them it's time to come. One message, one delivery, and it was final. Come. Do you know how long-suffering God must be for us that he would allow some of us to go years in our life given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity He does not owe that to you. He did not promise that to you. He simply says, come. Do you know one day you will hear the last invitation? You'll hear the master beckon you, come to me, the last time. Some Sunday morning service will be your last Sunday morning service. Some conversation with a brother in Christ about God wanting to save you, it'll be the last one. The invitation was final, just come. We have seen the supper, we've seen the timing, we've seen the invitation. Let's now look at the excuses. The excuses. These are so amazing to me. Uh, it's, I find it... <laughs> I find humor in the Bible where some people don't find humor. And I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't find a little humor in this parable. Look at what it says. It says, verse 17, And his servant at supper time, or he sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. All right, so all of them were of the same mindset. All of them said, I don't really, I don't want to come to dinner right now. I'm not interested. And they made it known by making excuses. Look, Look what we read here. 
The middle part of verse 18, it says, the first excuse, the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You hear these excuses. And as humorous as they are, listen, the first two, I'm, okay, whatever, I can kind of see it, all right? The, the, the third one, that's a smart man. A smart man. It's like, listen, listen, I'd, I'd like to come, trust me, I would like to get out of the house a little while, but I've married a wife, I can't come. I mean, that's basically what he says. I find in every one of these excuses, excuses that people use today for why they won't come to what God has offered and invited them to come to. The first man says, listen, I've, I've bought some ground and I, I, just, I need to go see it. I, I want to go take another look at it. We're, we're laying some things out. I need to go see this. I've, I've bought, I've got in my possession this thing that will not allow me to come to dinner. As much as dinner sounds good, and I'm sure it's going to be delightful, the thing that I've bought, the thing that I possess will not allow me to come. And I'm telling you, we are surrounded by a culture that has heaped wealth and possessions on people to the point they cannot come to the Lord because of all the things they own. They don't have time for God right now. Well, I've got the jet skis and the four-wheelers. I've got the side-by-sides. I've got the house. I've got you name it. I've got so many things I don't have time right now. I consider the things that God has given us to be blessings from God. What a shame it is for so many people, those blessings from God will be used as the very excuse to keep them from coming to him. What a shame. I've bought some land and I've got to go see it. The second excuse, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go work with them. I've got to go prove them. And this one, I don't find a possession. I find a profession. I find this man's job is getting in the way of the invitation from God. This, this, this Lord of the, of the supper has said, I've gone through all the work. I've planned. I've prepared. I've paid for it. I just want you to come and take what I've prepared for you. And this man says, I would like to come, but I've, you know, I'm a farmer, and I've got these ox, and I've got to go work with these oxen right now. I don't have time. Work's just so busy right now. You ever wonder what you miss by not being where you ought to be? You ever miss, you ever think about what you might miss? I do. Pastor Story used to say, and I, I understand it completely, and I fully agree with it now. Pastor Story used to say, sometimes I come to church because I want to see what's going to happen. There's some crazy things that happen in church, by the way. Funny things. Easter Sunday morning, 2010, I think it was. We're in the old building. The choir was singing whatever the Easter song was that they had worked on. And um, the auditorium was full. The auditorium was made for 150 people. And there was 200 and some people in there. It was packed. So I said, we'll just keep the choir up to give room down in the seats. And across the back row, I can still see so many of the people in the back row. Brother Isaac, Brother Wells, Brother Riccardi, all the way across. Jeff Lynn, all, all the way across. I can see all across the back row. And on the very end was a man named Eric. Eric Adloff. And um, uh, I, I uh, turned around and uh, told the choir they could be seated, and I heard the awfulest noise. Um, the, the, the choir had three steps, but originally the platform was built flat. And so when the choir grew to the point where there was multiple rows, we had to build steps, risers in there. The problem is, uh, the, you can't see it in here, but the, in the old auditorium, there was at the very edge of where the choir was, there was these, like a two-by-two two square built back. And so instead of building the steps to go back in that little area, no one would stand back there, it just went straight across. But what it did was created about a 30-inch step or 24-inch step down into that cavity. And through the course of choir practice and singing and standing and sitting, Eric's chair had worked its legs back on the very edge of that step. 
So on Easter Sunday morning, a very, very important service, we're getting ready to preach. And I said, you may be seated. And they sat down. Eric sat down. His chair fell off the back. I looked back. All I could see was Eric's legs and his hands sticking up in the air, flailing around, grabbing for anything, trying to get pulled back up out of that hole. Funny things happen in church. So I get it when Pastor Story says, I go to church and I, I want to see what's going to happen. I get it. But spiritually speaking, there's some truth to that as well. Hey, do, how many of you believe that, the, that God speaks to us through his word? That's why it's important to read it and study it. That's why it's important to listen to the teachers and the preachers. Not because of who I am, but because of the message that's being preached. So if God has a message for you to be delivered by a teacher or a preacher on that particular service, and you say, I'm sorry, I cannot come, I'm just too busy. You ever wonder what you might miss that God says, I've prepared this just for you? I think it happens. But as salvation is concerned, so many people say, I don't have time for God. Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. Yeah, I know I need to be saved, but I, I don't have time right now. It's a busy season at work. This career of mine, it just soaks me up. Someday when I retire, I'll have time and I'll sit down and I'll figure out things with God. Just the excuses. And then we find not just the possessions as an excuse, not just the profession as an excuse, we find the relation as an excuse. Now, as funny as it might seem to us, this man says, I've married a wife, I can't come. Think of, this, th think of how, how, how many times this thing happens. Hey, young men and young women that have been raised in church, Mom and dad and your pastor tells you, you better be careful who you run with. You better be careful who you date. You better be careful who you get connected with because they'll either push you closer to the Lord or they'll pull you further away. There is no neutrality in this thing. Hey, they tell you this because there's some truth to it. How many times? Young man, young woman fall in love. Oh, she's the one. Oh, he's the one not realizing that it's never going to be easier than it is as a single individual to be faithful to the Lord. So once you get married, there's a whole lot more going on. A whole lot more going on. This man says, you know, I, I hear the invitation. I understand the invitation. I understand the finality of the invitation. But my relationship with this woman will not allow me to come. If I come to this supper... It's going to cost me something in, an, in a relationship I have. I feel so unworthy to even preach about some things, and this is one of those, because my relationship with the Lord has not cost me very many relationships on this earth. But there are people in this congregation right now that when they got saved, some of their family said, we don't want any part of you. We don't like that. That's not what we believe. If you want it, fine, but don't bring it around us. People in this auditorium this morning have been separated from their loved ones. Why? Because they heard the invitation and they decided to come. We've seen the supper. We've seen the timing of the supper. Uh, we have seen the invitation. We've now seen the excuses. Now let me just very quickly point out the loss the loss. Look at what it says at the end of the passage there. The parable begins to wind down. These people make these excuses. Verse 21 then says, So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. It's incredible. Uh, this, this Lord says, okay, if, if the guests that are so high and prominent in society, if those who, who are so well-to-do and so busy, if none of them want to come, if they want to reject my invitation, then you go to every other person you can find. You walk the streets, you go down the alleys, you go down the byways, go down the, the hedges, you go everywhere you can find, and you extend the exact same invitation. It's still free. Still completely prepared. Still ready. You go tell anyone that you can find, come. One of the things that sets Christianity apart 
I'm not talking about carnal, secular Christianity. I'm talking about true faith in Jesus Christ. One of the things that sets it apart from nearly every other religion is every single person is the same. It doesn't matter how much money you have. That money might get you far in this world. It might buy you some favor with some people, but in the sight of God, you're no beggar, or no better than the beggar on the street. It gets you nowhere. The richest person in heaven and the poorest person in heaven are still in heaven. This, this Lord said, fine. Those people don't want to come. You go invite anybody you can find. The loss is a massive loss for those who reject the invitation. It's massive. Think, think of it in, in three different ways. I find this loss is impacting us in, in, in several ways. Number one, notice how eternal the loss was. That, that, listen, it wasn't just a, a missed meal that we're talking about. In the parable, that's what it was. When it comes to salvation, it's not just a one-time loss. It's an eternal loss. You, it will never be regained. You will never make up for the rejection and the loss of that invitation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The day is coming where those who reject the invitation will be eternally lost. We see that it was an eternal loss. We see that it's an irreversible loss. I find in Luke chapter 16 another, another story about a rich man and, and a, a beggar named Lazarus. I want you to listen to what the verse says in chapter 16, verse 26. It says, And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Here's what was going on. The rich man opened his eyes in hell and said, I, This is a place of torment. Save me from this place. He cried out for help, and they said, There's no help coming. It's eternal. Then here's what he said. Well, at least send somebody to go tell my family. Send someone back from the dead to go tell my family. Surely they would believe that. And here was the, was the message. It's too late for that. There's no going back. You don't get to go reclaim lost opportunities. You should have told your brethren, and you didn't. It's irreversible. This loss is not something to be taken lightly. It's an eternal loss. It's an irreversible loss. And then lastly, concerning the loss, it was an immeasurable loss. An immeasurable loss. As human beings, we have a desire to quantify everything. We want to measure and, and, and track everything. We want to know, by show of hands, how many of you have a have a, a bathroom scale at home. Yeah. We'll leave it there, don't worry. You know why you have that? Because you want to know, well, maybe you don't want to know. <laughs> you want to know how heavy you are. You want to know how you're, how you're doing. We, we have gauges for everything. We got a gas gauge because we want to know how much gas we have. Oil pressure gauge because we want to make sure there's enough oil in the car. We have coolant gauge, we have battery gauge, we measure, we, want to, we quantify everything. It is impossible to measure the loss, the eternal loss of the soul of man. It's impossible. We read that passage a little bit ago in, uh, about the parable of the rich man. Who God said, thou fool, this night thy soul will be required of thee. But in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, listen to what the Bible says. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The loss of a soul is greater than the value of the whole world. 
the, the, the loss of a soul. The soul of man is so precious that it sent God's only begotten son to die and bleed his life away in order to save the soul. It's an immeasurable loss. You cannot calculate it. It's absolutely incredible. The good news this morning is just as the parable ends, I would say this message and salvation would end the same way. In verse 22, it says this, And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. One evening in January in 1987, I proved this point to be true. God had been saving people for almost 2,000 years at that time in 1987. Millions of people over the centuries had been saved. Millions. And that night in Panama City, Florida, as I knelt next to my dad to pray and ask God to save me, you know what I found out? I found out there was still room for more. I found out that as, as many people as had been invited uh, to come to that salvation supper, as many people as had heard the, the inv invitation to come and had shown up and accepted the invitation, I found there was room for one more. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, would you save me? I can't do it myself. I would tell you this morning, there's still room. There's still room. What excuse will you make? What excuse? Oh, you know, I've got my reputation. Yeah, that reputation will be worthless the moment you close your eyes in death. Right. Oh, you know, I've got this relationship. You know, that relationship will be worthless the moment you close your eyes in death. I've got this job. You know, what will people think about me? That job will be worthless the moment you keep that final appointment and close your eyes in death. What excuse? Can I, what, what are you resting on this morning? The invitation is simple, come, just come. To the youngest person in here, the Lord says, come. To the oldest person here, the invitation's the same, just come to him, just come. I'll finish with this, I, I'm in my mind right now, I wish I had the reference, I, I can't recall it. Remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he was talking about how long he had waited for them to come to him. Here, here's what he said. How oft would I have gathered you to myself as a hen does her chickens? I, I would have brought you under my wings. I would, have, I would have collected you to myself. I called you. I pursued you. I came after you. But the saddest words of the passage are this. He says this, but you would not. There's coming a day where that spiritually speaking, will be the testimony of many people. God called you. He pursued you, gave you opportunity. He gave you church services. He gave you pastors. He gave you teachers. He gave you Christian friends. He gave you gospel tracts. He gave you his word. He gave you chance after chance after chance. And over and over again, you said, no, I will not. No excuse will stand in that day. It won't stand. Will you please close your Bibles and stand to your feet? You'd stand to your feet and bow your heads and stand quietly where you are. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the invitation to come. And this morning, I'm looking on a crowd of people that are as different from one another as they can possibly be. All different ages, all different professions, all different interests. And yet I'm looking on every one of you and I'm telling you the invitation from God the Father is come. Come. There's still room.
But the day is coming when the invitation will be passed. It's gone. But right now, he says, come. My Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the day you saved me and you made me part of your family. Father, I've done my best this morning. Lord, I don't know how to make people feel the urgency. So God, I pray through your Holy Spirit that you would smite the hearts. God, would you make that old message, that old story, please make it brand new in someone's heart today. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd love to pray for you. I would love to pray for you. If you say, preacher, I, I've heard the invitation. I know I need to come to him, but I, I've made excuses. I've put it off. But preacher, just, just pray for me. Please, preacher, pray for me. Would you lift your hand quietly and put it right back down so I can pray for you? Thank you. I see your hand. It might just be that you're here this morning and you've got a list of people you pray for often that you want God to to save. Friend, keep praying. Keep praying. Keep extending that invitation. Keep letting them know there's still room for one more. Now, Lord, I ask that you would please take this invitation. God, would you please do with it as you would see fit. Lord, you know the burdens of the people today. You know the needs they have, and I can't meet those needs, but you can. So, Father, would you please encourage these folks? And then, Lord, for those who are not saved, God, please don't give a moment's rest until it's settled with you. Please give a vehement desire to know you as their Savior. Well, thank you in Jesus' name, I pray. Just staying quietly there. The piano will play something. Brother Dowdy will sing a verse of a hymn. You just staying quietly. The altar is open this morning, and I hope you don't squander the opportunity. I said a while ago that some Sunday morning service will be your last. The Bible says you have no promise, no guarantee of tomorrow. It says life is just a vapor. What if your life's vapor is about to disappear? What if this is your last chance to accept the invitation to come to him. I make you this promise. If you will meet me at the altar, I will take the word of God and we will show you how you can be saved. Somebody will pray with you and you can place your faith in Jesus Christ. You can come to him this morning. Why would you wait? Why would, what if today is that appointment for you? Why would you skip it? Those excuses you're clinging to right now are going to be found to be worthless. It might be that you're here this morning and you've got a burden on your heart that I know nothing about. I promise you our Savior is the answer. Why don't you come make use of the altar? Why don't you tell him about it? Would you come? Just stand quietly, Brother Dowdy. Would you sing that first verse? Hey, Christians, you ought to be praying for those that are lost. To Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him
page 496 in your hymn book. Page 496, I surrender all. What's it going to take for you to surrender to him? What's it going to take? Man, what an opportunity you have this morning. If I were you and I was standing there knowing that I'm lost, I tell you what I would do. I would tap the person on the shoulder standing next to me and say, would you please go with me? I'm getting this settled today. I'm not ignoring the invitation again. Today's the day that I come to him. That's what I would do. Let's sing that first verse together. You come as we sing. We're not singing all day. This is for you. You come as we sing. this way. Thank you for being in church today. Smashies, y'all come right over here if you would, please. This is Brother Tim and Miss, uh, Miss uh, Debbie Smashy. They have been a part of Faith Baptist Church for a long, long time, many, many years, and uh, they've never officially joined. And uh, they told me on uh, Wednesday or Sunday, I forget when it was, they said that they, they wanted to make it official, apparently. And um, they know you when you're a member, you get preferred parking and all of that. So... <laughs> Um, they know winter time's coming. They're just trying to, to get, not really. All in favor of having them as a part of Faith Baptist Church, say amen. Yeah. All right. All opposed, go home. All right. Uh, Brother Tim, how about you and Miss Debbie go stand in the foyer? We'll come by and shake your hand and uh, welcome you to the church again, I guess, is the way that'll go. Thank you for being here this morning, everybody. I sure do appreciate it. If, if you're here as a guest and I have not met you yet, I hope that you'll let me at least shake your hand before you head out. And uh, it'll be in the foyer, and it'll be chaotic, but um, find me anyway, okay? I, I'd like to meet you. I uh, sure do appreciate you. Um, Brother Dowdy's got a meeting with the young people. If you're, going on the, uh, if you're going on the conference trip in August, he needs to have a quick meeting with you this morning. But also all of the teachers will be meeting in my office briefly at the same time. And um, other than that, just remember the... Announcements from, uh, from earlier, no, uh, no TFM, no choir practice, but service at 6 p.m. with a graduation service for our TFM students. And so be here for that tonight at 6 o'clock. All right, Brother Dowdy, would you come dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? And that meeting is also the parents of the teenagers going, if you can also be at that meeting if possible. Thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our church. Lord, thank you for what you do in our hearts. Lord, may we always... Uh, Lord, be uh, Lord, be receptive to the Word of God, and or may our hearts be tender. Pray, Lord, you be with the, all the activities going on today, the TFM graduation and meetings. Lord, I pray you uh, bring back everyone back safely this evening. Lord, we thank you again for all that you do for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm.